Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Pisa from 1200 uh, circa to the end of the Middle Ages, um, the expedition of Charles VIII. I already made a video about uh, the previous medieval Pisan history, so if you want you can access it from the Holy Roman Empire or medieval Italy or Italian Maritime Republic uh, playlists and, and others, uh, they're all there. Um, and we will naturally repeat some kind of background information just because the events will force us to do but you know if you're interested in you know how uh, Pisa had gotten to this point you can always rely on the aforementioned uh, bit. So at the beginning of the 13th century as a maritime republic um, Pisa undertook to normalize the relations with the rival Genoa. Uh, it would be temporary. Nevertheless, after having made an agreement with Venice in order to possibly support a prolonged clash with the Ligurians, so to pressure, in fact, the Genoese, Pisa undertook an attempt of peace with her historical rivals. Uh, in 1209 and 1217, there were, in fact, peace conferences in Lerici with the Genoese, which ended positively with the signing of treaties which guaranteed a 20-year period of peace between the two maritime powers. However, this reconciliation, as we've seen, was also um, pushed by, by arms, by deterrence, uh, in a way. First of all, as we've seen, the Venetians backing Pisa to stem partially in the, in fact, in the Tyrrhenian, and uh, the, even the Ligurian Sea, as there had been Pisan expeditions as far as uh, also not just Genoa, as we will see, would be even threatened, but even in, in the Genoese markets in southern France, uh, even in Spain. And so from there, blocking the, or at least diluting the, the competition with Venice in the east, that was by far the most important in which the, the Pisans themselves were involved. From the other hand, there was also the more um, uh, broader continental situation with the struggle between uh, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines within the Holy Roman Empire. Here we are in the age of Frederick II, and as we've seen, the Pisans had received historically from the Otteville and the Hohenstaufen uh, lots of rights within the Sicilian kingdom, its uh, dependencies, and fundamentally becoming the privileged uh, city of, of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, navally wise, uh, because essentially the, it was the only true uh, loyal port to the emperor in the Kingdom of Italy, and as such, uh, the universal ruler could confirm, um, in fact, important rights, not just in the Kingdom of Sicily, that technically was not even a Holy Roman Empire, but uh, beyond, as we will see the Kingdom of Sardinia was created as a feudal um, entity of, of the Empire exactly at this point to confirm much of the Pisan uh, presence uh, and prerogatives there uh, and um, in general Pisa also was, was an important bulwark uh, for avoiding Guelph uh, Tuscan cities to have a, an access to the sea and therefore countering uh, the emperor, right? Genoa at this point was usually essentially mm, pro-papal, so wealth, and um, part of the broader competition between the two maritime republics was connected with with this all. Um, Frederick II, in fact, confirmed Pisa's possession of the Tyrrhenian coast from Civitavecchia to Porto Venere, so it's basically from the, almost the region of Rome. To, uh, to Liguria, right, and this meant, uh, and it's uh, relatively untypical for maritime um, uh, republics, to, to have an important interland, right, that in this case basically blocks any access along the entire Tuscan coast to all the other communes in the interland. Th this is quite important because as, as we will see, it was a rampant communal development, so urban um, expansion, demographic and uh, economic mm, needs that required, in fact, an opening 
to the sea. Um, and this would uh, trigger a further conflict within Tuscany that the peasants had to uh, address properly in, in a land policy. All the other maritime republics normally didn't have much of a hinterland, right? Venice was in a lagoon, uh, Amalfi had been just, you know, they had mountains in, 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 in the back. The same goes for Genoa. And, and so Pisa was more dynamic, which renewed hostilities towards the city, not only from Genoa, but also from the, from the Tuscan ones. And especially the rivalry with Florence now became more alive due to the rapid growth of Florentine industry and the effort of Florence to open uh, her own way towards uh, the sea. Fl Florence was a, a champion of, of wealthism, albeit there were alternate phases in which uh, also the Ghibellines prevailed. So uh, actually the, in the internal policy of Tuscany is very complicated as you can understand now also from the same vicissitudes of um, Pisan domestic affairs and we'll probably make other videos on these very um, issues uh, in uh, in detail but also hopefully covering the entire uh, area by discussing uh, every single commune so uh, when I say it's complicated it is really complicated and, and I can't help but making hours long video in order to explain this in, in a satisfactory way uh, at least. Um, so in the following years there were clashes also with Luca that as we've seen is just north of, of Pisa and, and thus very active even in contending uh, the control of the lower Arno Valley uh, and so all basically the, the, the major a route of exports um, uh, towards the sea of the Tuscan interland with some effect frontier clashes, the construction and destruction of castles and things like this. Pisa is the strongest, uh, it's the largest city, it's the best uh, place, it, but it fights uh, for a long time with look. In this case, um, these years in, Garf in the Garfagnana area, in the Versilia area, um, and there is also uh, naturally a, a, a connection, um, a system of alliances that brings the Florentines to defeat the Pisans uh, in, in, in this broader rivalry at Castel del Bosco in 1222. Um, in all this, Pisa, and we stressed this in the previous video, had always maintained a deeply Roman and imperial identity, um, which made it uh, in, indissolubly linked with the empire um, and uh, drawing in this sense as also the only true maritime uh, Tuscan city that the, the hostility of, of the interland in general right aside from the various um, subdivisions because there were of course other Ghibelline Tuscan centers but um, having a, a very different role normally from from the rest um, of, of the of the region this brought w uh, to tensions all, obviously also with the papacy that at, at some point especially during the early expansion of Pisa in the 11th in the 12th century had provided the Tuscan commune with an important series of prerogatives especially properly to, uh, to, to, to create new dioceses, some of the territories that were reconquered in the western Mediterranean were stripped from uh, Saracen control, so there, with the, at least the restructuration of the local churches came also a lot of papal grip locally with uh, some legacies um, managed by, by the peasants in the process. But uh, as you know, in the age of Frederick II, the papacy and the emperor were literally fighting um, some of the most devastating wars in fact had been fought um, in Europe up to that point and Pisa was naturally backing uh, and being backed by the Emperor. Um, so the papacy uh, tried to uh, hinder Pisan ambitions by making the Ghibelline commune lose the positions it had acquired in the Sardinian judicates of Gallura Arborea and Torres. Um, 
as we have explained also in a previous video, uh, the, the Italians had fundamentally managed to colonize a great part of the uh, Corsican and Sardinian uh, coast line, right, and even penetrating deeper in the interland. Sardinia had these judicates that were essentially policies, uh, the organization of which dated uh, as, as a broader model to back to Roman times, right? They were somewhat centralized. It had an, an interesting um, um, juridical tradition. But comparatively to the rampant Italian communes, they had much less resources, right? The Sardinian interland is somewhat, you know, wild. And just b uh, a few of it is uh, really fertile and, and developed. And that's where also the, uh, the Italians fundamentally settle. Um, and uh, expanding their control further. So the, the papacy there was just essentially um, trying to undermine the uh, peasant presence in this case by uh, essentially uh, stripping it of the prerogatives that it had had on the local polities. During the 30s and uh, of the 13th century, uh, the papacy, however, was suffering several military defeats, including uh, that of the same Lombard League that was defeated, for example, at, at Corte Nuova uh, in 1237. And so uh, in, in that moment, essentially, the Guelph uh, alliance in Italy was suffering heavy blows. Naturally, the system was very resilient, right? It was several uh, cities, of the, the most important ones, leading the struggle against the emperor and his uh, supporters uh, and s s being subsidized by the papacy naturally um, and so in, in this phase there were many alternate fortunes because as you know in the long run um, the Ghibellines would be properly defeated but so far Pisa was betting uh, dramatically on the uh, the empire right in the Ghibelline system because they had really not much to lose right as maritime republics they 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 counted on that broader international port function that would have always tried, especially in, in a politically united um, landscape. And so supporting the centralizing ambitions of Frederick II that, uh, as we've seen, also uh, had so many peasant um, colonies, uh, quarters, markets in the same Sicilian kingdom was, was crucial, right, for 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 the commune. Um, Pisa within Tuscany was also close to Pistoia, Siena and Arezzo that at the time were Ghibelline and made a common front against Florence that was instead the uh, Guelph Tuscan um, headquarter fundamentally and an important base properly connecting central Italy uh, to the Po Valley um, in it would remain like this also as a broader enemy of, of Pisa uh, in Tuscany in the following generations. We will see this because at the end of the day, um, the, the strongest Ghibelline city w was um, was Pisa throughout all this time, right? The Pisans at some point would have some... Um, they, they, they wouldn't just got war for, for the sake of it, right? Th this was not a, a, a commune that could have broader territorial ambitions like, say, Milan or Florence at, at a point would be as also more kind of by default um, terrestrial powers. They would try to expand in some cities, but at the same time, their their main interest was, was in the sea, right? So uh, as we've seen in the Pisan case, a bit more of land bias, but mm, definitely it would have cost them too much to expand further um, in the interland. They tried it at some point, especially along the the Arno Valley, because that was the main, as we've seen, the main artery and had some of the most fertile uh, areas. Uh, but it, it's the international policy that actually mm, changed the game uh, more broadly. Um, in 1238, thanks to Genoa's dissatisfaction with Frederick II's policy, that at some point they had also been okay with, uh, in the Ligurian city, but um, you see, this is just the day, uh, the the year after Corte Nuova. So, it's a moment where, even those were a bit 
just not necessarily neutral, but they're just a bit awaiting to see what, what happens, freak out because they think that uh, the emperor will become too powerful. So Pope Gregory the Ninth, in this occasion, ma um, managed to form an alliance that involved Genoa and Venice, um, united against those who disobeyed the papacy, so namely the emperor and consequently Pisa w together with him. The f because they feared naturally to lose their their autonomies, their prerogatives, considering that they were also kind of more important centers than, than Pisa. Uh, and so the emperor would have, like, in case of, of a broader victory in Italy, would have surely privileged, um, at least initially, to, to some broader local resistance, a, a kind of the less threatening power with whom they had already um, cooperated so much without uh, ambiguities. So the following year, the Pope proceeded to excommunicate Frederick II and then called an anti-imperial council for 1241 to be held in Rome. So the, the previous agreement with Genoa was able to materialize with the escort that the Ligurian city granted for transport of the prelates of northern Italy and France to the Eternal City on the occasion of that council. So after having tried in vain to prevent the departure by attacking Genoa by land and conquering Larici even in the process, a Pisan fleet which was joined by an imperial, read Sicilian one in that case, from, in fact from, from Sicily and led by uh, Heinz or Enzo that was the son of Frederick and uh, king of Sardinia, we will see that later, uh, faced the escort and a battle took place in fact on that May the 3rd 1241 near the island of Giglio in Tuscany ending with a heavy defeat for Genoa which costed the capture 25 galleys and a few thousand prisoners including two cardinals and various bishops. Um, this was an important blow because it showed that Pisa first of all could stem Genoese pressure um, uh, in the Mediterranean it could effectively counter Genoese activities and uh, in this sense support uh, depriving the papacy of essentially the, the most valuable um, wealth port in that case for this broader international con connections um, and um, the, the, the damage was also considerable the, um, thinking about the number of galleys and, and the prisoners. And there was naturally the, the broader ideological impact, but this was the emperor winning on a pope that was considered also like, uh, um, they, they all consider each other's uh, antichrist in a way or another. So the, the prelates uh, per se, like they were subsequently released because also internationally Pisa didn't want to act like, you know, we're countering the the uni any universal authority just per se, right? But th the most important thing there was political because uh, it made the council against Frederick II fail, right? In fact, this wouldn't take place. Um, and um, it, it this entailed, however, the excommunication of the commune of Pisa, uh, accompanied by the revocation of the ecclesiastical privileges granted in the past in the various um, Medi uh, Western Mediterranean islands. This excommunication would be, uh, however, revoked in 1257, a long time afterwards, telling the truth, but still uh, for reasons that could change, uh, except Pisa wouldn't change the side uh, in, in that matter. Especially the momentary Genoese weakness was exploited by Pisa, uh, by conquering the Corsican uh, town of Aleria and in 1243 even besieging Genoa herself, albeit in vain. Um, however, the Ligurian Republic recovered quickly and in 1256 managed to reconquer Lerici and that's also why, as we've seen there, Pisa kind of negotiated and also the excommunication the year, the year after was was revoked. Um, this was an interesting um, 
prodrome to the the final um, Genoese victory, as you know, over the rival. Um, that was was not so drastic as one would think, but would objectively mark the the Pisan, especially maritime decline, as an independent power in that regard. Um, it was autonomous, but still fundamentally on the trail of other uh, of other especially financial powers at that point had been surpassing her. Um, uh, uh, after the Battle of Montaperte in 1260, when uh, the Sienes, the Ghibelline Sienes, defeated the Florentine Guelphs, and in fact a Ghibelline regime was installed in the same Florence by the exiles, um, Pisa regained uh, lost castles in, uh, in, 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 the, in the interland frontier, um, this was a moment of important coming back of the mm, properly the, the international Ghibelline alliance, you know, with Manfred, the illegitimate son of Frederick II that had died in 1250, uh, and um, the um, actually the, the impressive um, power that the the Sicilian king uh, achieved also in, in the central and northern Italian communes through his German mercenaries and the, the power of his kingdom. I made a video about Manfred last year, so if you're interested, again, there is a, a world playlist. Um, in this case, I, I don't know whether I framed it within the Holy Roman Empire because it's um, he wasn't truly um, part of it, but um, you find it in medieval Sicily or, or medieval Italy in general. Um, and it's a very overlooked figure, and it, it's the one that actually cemented more uh, more properly the wealth gibbling struggle, paradoxically even after his father had died. And that's also another very overlooked period in European uh, history. At this point on the sea, allied with the Venetians, um, already rivals in the east. Uh, Pisa now united um, by hatred for the Genoese, right, and managed to, to, to beat uh, Genoa uh, at uh, St. John of Acre in 1258, where, as you know, the, um, there were several quarters of the various uh, Italian uh, maritime republics that every once in a while engulf these Levantine cities by quarreling uh, with each other but without local powers really managing to do anything about that. Um, so with the expansion of the peasant presence in the Mediterranean, which was definitely happening because all these powers were rising, right? The, the most important thing was how you know, faster than the other you can rise. But the, we're talking still about an expansive pace. Um, so th there was also a consolidation of the interests of the peasant merchant estates. And this unavoidably came to modify the institutional system of the commune. The office of consul that, as we made lots of videos about the Italian communes and also the consular regime, right? So this was uh, the original um, one that had literally created the commune and was embodied by the knightly class um, that included lots of other elements but in this in fact properly military clans that had been ruling as a sort of nobiliar elite right very much like in the feudal system well this this office disappears because at this point in in the in the communes um, first of all other systems um, appeared the, the podestas on the long run, but especially there is a great popular expansion. Now, the, the people are not literally to be meant as the, like, in a classist sense of the lower classes even. Th these were just people who were rich and powerful, telling the truth, um, but that had not been part of the so-called militia that w would be also kind of locked uh, at this point because uh, by being very inclusive at the beginning now couldn't really absorb the entire estates that were emerging at the time. So around the 30s of the 13th century um, the, uh, the, the, the people in fact um, developed this new uh, institution of the captain of, of the people. 
that was uh, in fact paralleled with the creation of a practically a paramilitary force of, of sort, right? So what you see, what had always been existing in the form of, for example, especially within the uh, the narrow city streets, uh, the the power of infantry uh, was quite developed in Italian communes and especially in the in the maritime ones, exactly because the kind of the the the, the people was more entrepreneurial, they had more revenues from the from the maritime business. Um, the peasants developed just like the Genoese importantly their missile power and differently from the Genoese actually would probably create the single and probably because they had this also this land interest, the single most um, doctrinally efficient army in a communal Italy, especially in the at the peak of, of the communal civilization in the early 14th century. This is a very overlooked topic. I think we'll have to make lots of videos about this because it's literally like the word that they were topping European tactics and kind of nobody knows this um, on the Oxford um, you know medieval warfare there, there isn't even the Battle of Montecatini that arguably was the tactically wise and also by the size the single most important in medieval Europe and I'm not mm, kidding about that for that matter just for telling you how uh, m m still contemporary scholarship is oblivious, blind, um, you know, cognitively dissonant or something. Um, and the, there is a very special alchemy in the, in fact, political institutional uh, balance of Pisa that would provide with that incredible military quality. That, however, again, still as a maritime power was, was quite conservatively used, at some point also missing important opportunities such as, I don't know, defending Sardinia from the Aragonese and, and such things, um, at least, you know, with, a, with an important effort. Um, uh, and that's why we should get in some details in other videos that here we can't cover, but I will try to, to make myself clear uh, later. Because uh, we are at the beginnings of this. Um, despite um, the reform work that had occurred in the commune as well as the territories subjected to it because you know that the Italian communes had this essentially prerogative that they would systematically subjugate other communes which is something you don't really find uh, in other countries because they didn't have the same the cities didn't have the same power like uh, in, in the Italic kingdom and, and this um, strong tension about what direction the commune would have to take on this, because it, it entailed huge interests, right? There was a novel party and in a continental party, there was a, a Guelph party and a Ghibelline party in a more international sense. There were some social tensions, just per se. There, there was rivalry between various clans. Um, there were rivalries um, regarding which, you know, policy to to undertake with, with the other maritime republic and which to ally or not. So this complication would always entail conflict but also an important civil work that in, in this city maintained especially a, a very very significant balance so the main clans at this point in peasant history are famously enough the uh, della Gerardesca and the Visconti families not the Visconti of Milan there were several families called like this um, and after various attempts of peace including that of 1237 by the Archbishop and the, and the Emperor Frederick II that naturally intervened in these struggles because they cared um, which direction Pisa would, would turn. In 1254, the people, uh, it's important to stress, after a Pisan defeat by the Guelph League, with a revolt imposed the new institution of the Twelve Elders of the People as their representatives at the helm of the commune. This is particularly important because you realize how also military defeats are fundamentally political failures and so there is a broader need of reform that kicks in when especially the city is more vulnerable because when your army is, is uh, defeated uh, in open field you, you, you suffer because the enemy is worn into your territory, um, takes castles, approaches the city, uh, raids its outskirts. So the thing does get serious and there is the need for a political uh, cohesion and recompaction. 
Then next to the old legislative councils composed of noblemen, of the militias, um, there was the introduction of the People's Council f formed by representatives of the main guilds and by the heads of um, also the people's companies with the function of r ratifying the laws ap approved by the general major council and the senate of Pisa. Uh, so the, all these institutions worked uh, quite closely as you understand they had de facto various veto powers on each other and so if the commune wanted to achieve its results had compromise between these forces and so you know evolving also institutionally along that pattern. Uh, speaking of the mm, Tyrrhenian islands uh, at this point um, starting with Corsica the influence of Pisa was um, extended in Federation times uh, as we've seen properly the kingdom of Sardinia was, was created at this point um, and de facto gemonized by the by the Orange Staff and through the peasants and Sicily, etc. So in, in Sardinia, as we've seen, the peasant presence had risen s s s since the end of the 12th century. Cagliari, the most important city in, in the south, uh, with an important agricultural background, um, in the interland, uh, was conquered in 1187 by the um, judge. Oberto of Massa, thus a peasant that was essentially a, a, a local uh, Sardinian authority. And thus the, the most important center in the island had remained under peasant influence. Uh, as you know, for, for the peasants, Sardinia was a sort of uh, El Dorado because of the precious metals there, the, the fact that they could establish signories on their own um, and, and there was a bit that kind of cocky feudal military mentality on kind of uh, of the colonizer in this island, especially in the interland, uh, where the, the this expansion was relatively unchecked at least by by higher powers. Whereas you know the the communal life in Pisa was much more republican, right? And people were definitely more allergic to the um, to the emergence of just um, some oligarchs could kind of hegemonize power on their own. Um, so there was sort of a, a, a bulb event. This is true for the Venetians too in Crete and, and, and so on. It was a sort of autonomous reality as well because these various clans just invested on their own on the shipbuilding, on the crews, on the mercenaries, uh, on their arms um, to, to carry out the, this conquest. So mm, as far as the commune was concerned, yes, everybody knew about this and there was naturally a wild political debate about it, but it was something happening outside. And on the base of local Sardinian institutions were filled by the peasants in, the, in, in that way. Um, in 1215, um, uh, Cagliari had been occupied by the Visconti family, albeit temporarily, um, and the peasants in 1216 built the Castel di Castro above the city which was a stronghold um, becoming de facto the you know the, the, the bulwark to peasant power over the judicate and and the island altogether the, the peasants settled naturally mostly on the coast because they cared still about controlling the ports and the Therefore, the, the trade flow from, from the interland and, and between the interland and the sea. They created small communities of merchants in the ports, just like elsewhere in the Mediterranean. They obtained from the local Sardinian judges the power to establish consuls and mayors. And as we've seen, some uh, judges were literally peasants themselves. Because the peasant commune had been supported by the empire in the assertion of its sovereignty over the judges, right? This was not full, uh, the, the island was never fully controlled and again, it was not normally their interest. But uh, the more powerful citizens by means of marriages with the heiresses of the judges or by daring coups, um, militarily speaking, um, took possession of 
one or or, or, or the other of the judges, right? And the Archbishop Federico Visconti raised the prestige of primate and papal legate in Sardinia with one of his journeys in 1263. So after complex events that part we will address that intertwined with the internal struggles of the city and the external ones, especially with Genoa. Uh, by the eve of the battle of uh, Melorian in 1282, the, the Visconti were judges of Gallura. The Gerardesca instead dominate the Logudoro and presumed heirs of uh, Heinz, king of Sardinia, the judicate of Cagliari is divided in three parts, two of which belong to the Gerardesca and the Visconti, um, while the judicate of Arborea is a Pisan ally. Right, so the Pisan influence on Sardinia at this point is, is very strong, especially at the top again at the time of Frederick II. Um, so the the Ghibelline commune uh, was naturally thriving as long as the Hohenstaufen were in power. Right during the 13th century, however, you know that the imperial power declined in favor of the French, that also set foot in Italy and substitute uh, themselves literally as kings of Sicily to the Hohenstaufen and, and and more. So this had repercussions on peace and politics and society to the point of shattering uh, Ghibelline hegemony on the city uh, that however would be restored uh, in the end um, so the aristocracy of ship owners already the backbone of the what, what was now the disappeared consulate was still trying to direct the politics of the commune through the this other institution was the consulate of the sea that naturally tells you how important the the maritime policy of the commune really was, which uh, arose towards the end of the, 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 the 12th century, uh, dealing in fact with maritime matters and the, the colonies, but also had governmental functions in the commune, right, as the representative of what are still the supreme interests of the city that largely lay overseas. At this point, the fat people, so what you could call as a sort of bourgeoisie or just, you know, some other aristocracy, but of non nobilier stock, and everything is blended here, um, managed at this point to penetrate the consulate and exclude the, mm, the milites from it. So, I remember this concept that in Italy there is hardly, uh, especially in the communes, hardly any properly feudal nobility as such, right? Uh, the milites are literally knights, like all the others. Um, in the continent, except they are such by census, right? They, if you are rich enough, you have the duty and the privilege to fight on horseback in the communal army and to have all these mm, uh, mob-like prerogatives of the city, fundamentally, aside from the fact that, of course, all these various clans would always quarrel against each other. So, now this other, this, this mm, um, newly enriched uh, estate emerges to, to contest the rights of these people. Um, and um, uh, there are merchants of the wool, the, there, are, there are all these various guilds that, um, of course, are deeply involved themselves in, in maritime affairs, so they're not really countering any naval policy or anything, it's just they, are, they want to participate, they want to gain uh, rights to decide also for their own interests. Um, and they gradually predominate in communal life. Um, while the lesser mm, citizens, uh, the, the, the little people as they were called, are um, organized in the arts instead. They are smaller business, smaller guilds. They also have their own councils and so on. These two blocks, right, the, the noble and the people, form respectively in a commune militum, so the commune of the knights, technically, which is opposed naturally due to the consolidation of the various um, armed societies of the people to, in fact, the societas populi, so the alliance 
uh, of the people. Um, all these organisms which have their heads and, um, and uh, constitutions, by the way, and dispose of, of money and weapons, um, small communes within the commune, you can argue, because the commune had been born just as a big guild, right, are represented alongside the Podesta in the city councils. The Podesta, we, we, we say it very often, is, is essentially an external mm, governor that mostly, with, with an important legal expertise, but mostly a military experience that has to uh, watch over the 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 local constitution so and, and so and taking decisions leading the army and doing other things in the full respect of the communal government and in theory acting super partes because that was this paralyzing moment in which they realized that uh, this either political or social rivalries as they were intertwined were were blocking the effectiveness of, of, of communal action right so they needed some arbiter that would mediate uh, and that would in theory be again just as a foreigner so normally it was these were other Italians but they considered them as the forestiere right so somebody that comes from from the outside of the commune and that's mostly where the, the local identity laden at this time to decide impartially and uh, the various institutions are naturally deeply intertwined, blended together. This is true also for the, the nobility and the people, right? Um, and until in, in the second half of, of, the, of the 13th century, the noble, like in most Italian communes, mm, begin to be driven out of the political regime, right? Um, this in Pisa manifests specifically in 1254, um, which has to do in part also with the difficulties deriving now with, with the weakening of, of the Hohenstaufen and, and uh, all a series of, of circumstances. Um, this means that some, because the nobility is seen again as practically having locked down, uh, locked in, in, in its own privilege, uh, hampering the kind of the civil development especially in a moment where the commune was defining ever more statally speaking the properly the prerogatives um, like the tax systems all these things that meant properly to, to create an apparatus that somebody had to manage right and some are exiled so when they are some populars are exiled as well when it was feared they could make a cope or something some noble men also join the people so it, it, it's that fluid really but what matters is the prevalence of the captain of the elders and of the people, which uh, define also themselves as proper institutions and as the leadership of, of the communes. Again, these are very hierarchical systems. They are not like a popular revolution or a class has struggled. None of this thing. It's just, just the emergence of some estates that had previously been prevented to, to exploit some of the uh, main uh, sources of income of, of the commune. In, in, by the way, in an expensive phase, after all. Um, and even the same concept of wealth and ghibelline is quite labile, right? It can change depending on, on the situation. Um, the, the ghibellines, generally speaking, are, are more... Um, uh, they believe more in it, properly in the ideology of of the of the empire altogether what the feudal hierarchy had to be and it's paradoxical because Pisa was very proud of her uh, liberty right so um, somebody oppressing her as we will see also in, in the imperial best was would have been thoroughly disliked but they knew what their role as that specific Tuscan maritime republic really was in, in Europe as a role for um, in, in the struggle between the the imperial and the papal powers. Um, so, in, in general, the old mercantile aristocracy um, continued the traditions of the commune, right? The, in, the industrial bourgeoisie, if we can call it like this, um, was still rivaling um, Florence, and thus they were Ghibellines. 
tendentially. The, the greater feudal aristocracy and the common people are, are wealth, which, especially in case of aristocracy, is not to be given for granted at all, right? Because uh, normally aristocracy was tended to be more ghibelline in nature, proving how differently balanced Pisa was compared to the average Italian commune in a much more kind of properly republican uh, mind frame. Um, and equally, uh, they, they were in a sense of style to, to the Ghibelline commune as it was developing because that there was a sort of populism involved in all this. Like it's um, a bit like um, today, let's say, well, it's difficult to make the co this comparison, but let's say when there is a statal power that consolidates, and it is for, in a sense, the broader purpose of delivering an effective political power abroad, etc. There is a sort of populist attitude saying, ah, we don't want to pay taxes because these people are, you know, are controlling us. It's all a big scam and all these things. And the most conservative element, at least the one that is not able, like the feudal aristocracy in that case, not to seize power of their own, starts to make ideologism to fuel that populism, even though well, as soon as they come to power, they, they immediately get uh, in line with the broader thing because it's obviously the most intelligent thing to do, as, especially as being an enterprising political and military power. Um, and it's worth mentioning that, however, this balance occurs because the, the commune is strong, right? The, the peasant communal institutions are very solid. They're not eroded by um, private powers in the same measure in which n the average Italian commune really is. Um, because again, these are the most important urban centers. They're, they're most civilized, the most advanced, right? They're not just like the one of some Apenninic um, interland that are smaller and so they have less resistance to the, the local um, warlords, feudal lords, um, with which they always kind of intertwine their, their destinies. The commune here is quite aware of its own balance, right? And even though everything is like in any pre industrial system, pretty, you know, as we've seen, fluid, pretty changing and surely private by a, by a degree and, uh, and um, oilable, let's say, um, with money and all, you, um, you realize that there is a very strong civic unity. And uh, this is extremely important in this phase because for a long time historiography said, well, but eventually the, this, this means that the, the commune was declining in a, in a way, because especially as we will see now after the Meloria. Um, and after that, Pisa wouldn't be... Well, well actually, for, for a good century, Pisa would maintain um, uh, an inviolable mm, political and, and military power. And that, yes, it would be mostly turned at that point, especially towards the interland, where the peasants scored very important military um, victories. Mm, and thanks to this, in fact, properly maritime political social balance that n is so exceptional because normally you don't find it employed on land, right? Venice doesn't care about that. Genoa doesn't care about that. Like, you don't find Venice or Genoa fighting... Uh, pitch battles in the middle of Italy. There, there's none of that. Pisa does. And and from there you can measure this effectiveness. Uh, albeit, uh, it is true that there were some major political and strategic issues that were at least missed by the city and probably because there was some kind of I don't want to spend too many money for this, so I will lose much more, but at the time it seems so bad to pay taxes and so on. This is the fucked up mentality that of course it's developing uh, in this time in history also um, regarding anything because people are much less worth of properly in intelligently speaking so they don't understand that in order to achieve anything you have to make a dramatic effort just like the, the peasants in fact had done in the moment of their greater uh, greater expansion narrowly speaking it was nothing short of, of extraordinary um, to say the least, right? So there, there was a massive set of conflicts going on uh, between all these clans, families, parts, factions, uh, individuals, um, and so everything must be understood in detail now through sources, through 
specialized historiography. Today we can't talk about that, but it, 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 it's important to understand how the mechanism worked uh, concretely. So in, in this tumult, uh, the um, ancient feudal family of the Visconti that was um, still rich in adhesions and privileges um, uh, was um, adverse to the more recently uh, urbanized one of the Gerardesca because these were all families that had historically come from some sort of you know feudal rural background of some sort at least all these these families had a properly land estate all around the city so this was the, the process through which the commune also had formed through that military aristocracy coming to live in the city beginning to create their own house towers um, fortified quarters within the city herself and so on um, and so there was uh, a great attrition as they were both trying they were, they were the most important uh, clients that were trying to establish their own individual power um, and first they were at war with each other within Pisa and in Sardinia right you have instances of I don't know the bishop of, of, of Pisa bringing in a catapult to bombard a tower from the the garden of, of, a, of a house uh, it, it's how violent the communal dialectic could could get um, the the Visconti were traditionally Guelph while the Gerardesca were Ghibellines right and um, and close to the commune against the threatening return of the power of the Visconti. Then um, the Gerardesca began to threaten the commune themselves. Finally, for some time, the two clans coexisted to share control over the city herself. Um, this process naturally is not easy for the commune because it means that a lot of resources are also burned in, in this in interesting struggle so the uh, hopes of the Ghibellines are cut short by internal struggle as also the international situation is deteriorating and the two things are naturally interconnected because there are new uh, balances of power that different uh, estates are want to exploit in fact in different ways um, the major event in the 13th century is definitely the the end of Ghibelline hopes at the Battle of Benevent and the answering one of Tagliacozzo and the beheading of the last male heir to the Ollenstaufen uh, legacy uh, by the hand of Charles of Anjou that beheaded in fact Conradin on the square uh, Market Square of Naples, 1268. Um, this brought properly a massive shattering of Ghibelline power because, first of all, Germany was in, into chaos and fragmentation. There was the interregnum. Uh, it would take uh, until, in fact, we'll see now. Pisa was quite involved in this to the tens of the the first ten of of the, the second ten of, of the 14th century when for, for an emperor to to come back to Italy again. And in the process, the Angevins that had conquered the entire kingdom of Naples, albeit they would lose uh, Sicily in, in the Vespers uh, in 1282, uh, spread their their control. Albeit it was, again, a decentralized one and uh, also somewhat, um, you know, light one. It was not a particularly pervasive one. And s but on, on most of central and northern Italy. After all, they were interested in making a trade flow. It was an, in, an interesting um, moment of stability, in a sense, brought by that, in spite of the of, of how the the entire um, French installation, especially in Naples, had occurred. Um, and and this damaged, obviously, the, the Ghibelline communes. Charles had conquered the kingdom with the favor of, of the Pope and with the gold of Florence. Never forget this. Basically, the Angevins sold their soul to, to the Florentines, to the Tuscan bankers, the Guelph Tuscan bankers. So that basically 
the latter would see subcontracted the entire uh, Sicilian grain export. Consider that Sicilian grain was exported was, was so big that it was exported both in Europe and in North Africa. Right? Historically, it was North Africa that had been importing in antiquity grain to the northern shores of the Mediterranean. At this point, Sicily basically exported it everywhere. So this brings, needless to say, to the boom of Florence and of the Guelph party in Tuscany. And this means big troubles with, uh, for, for Pisa. Actually, Charles doesn't uh, surely need more enemies than the ones he had created uh, uh, in, for, uh, say, in establishing his power in southern Italy. And after all, his interests were more Mediterranean than strictly like uh, Italian. He wanted to reconquer Constantinople. There was all the, the universal thing. And for this reason, he actually established normal trade relations with Pisa at the time. But in Tuscany, as in the rest of Italy, um, the Guelphs are ahead, right? And they are uh, with also with Naples. That is also a formidable military power. So that uh, Charles sends various contingents uh, scattering them all over the the Guelph cities in Italy um, and this means by the way that uh, of course Florence um, Lucca so the, the traditional enemies of of Pisa are well supplied in case of war and so on um, at this point Giovanni Visconti and the Count Ugolino de la Gerardesca famed because uh, what we'll see now um, were expelled from the city because they were feared to threaten communal freedom right these men had showed a Guelph sympathy at Asciano on July the 2nd 1275 the Guelph Talia that is the, this league essentially the, the, of cities that put money in common for the for the army defeated Pisa right so there is a these are small say relatively small battles but uh, that were eroding further Pisan power so it shows the wealth pressure increase on the Pisan um, district uh, peace in fact is obtained under very harsh conditions and with the return of Ugolino and the Guelphs right so this in this moment properly the, the Ghibelline axis of, of Pisa is, is destroyed. Um, there is um, uh, essentially a Guelph regime now that naturally is uh, mediated in some form. Pisa doesn't renounce to her autonomy but has mostly to, 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 to act at least as if you know the, it, it was just in line with, with the Guelph with a Guelph order. The war with Genoa renewed in 1282 and this is actually the most important blow leads in fact to the Pisan disaster of the Meloria by the way it, it's a such a heavy blow if, first of all f just for the sheer amount of galleys and um, and uh, and troops that the Pisans lost uh, enormous this was a classical um, medieval naval battle in which the 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 Genoese managed to to, out to destroy a, an enemy flank to, to attack it it's but just like um, just like land battles with an attack of concealed reserve and, and so on this mm, battle is also fought on the day of saint sistus which is um sacred for pisa as the some triumphs had been scored on that day that is august the 6th um Melaria was fought actually in um in 1284 before i also said uh, 82 but it's 84 at, at this point, um, Ugolino, that was one of the leaders of the Pisan fleet, you see, the clash had kept going on with Genoa in spite of this kind of Guelph alignment, uh, was accused of treason, right? Because they f thought that, that this was frequent, actually, that um, by betraying one um, your own city, you could still kind of become like the leader of it in the process and so just securing for you and your clan some, some power naturally w w 
will not know exactly what, what happened in, in that sense because a victory would have surely brought to some kind of peasant revival anyway. Um, in um, the, the Golino was created nevertheless Podestan captain of the people, so kind of monopolizing power in 1284-85. Um, and this was done, in fact, thanks to the Guelph support, right? With the agreement of the Guelph League that now even threateningly united with the Genoese. Um, so much so that Ugolino was also forced to conclude peace with Florence and with Lucca at the price of sale of castles on, on the Pisan border, Pisan frontier. So Ugolino della Gerardesca and Nino Visconti that was judge of Gallura uh, at the time, the latter of whom had been hired as a colleague by the first in this lordship de facto over over the city, uh, reformed in 1286 the brevet, that is the constitution of the commune and of the people, by the way, um, according to essentially the needs of a noble government that could still perhaps mm, restore in Pisa the order and power lost when the consulate had been, uh, had been uh, demoted. But these struggles between the two rectors, the insurrection of the Archbishop Ruggeri degli Ubaldini uh, and the Ghibelline nobility that was against this, again, uh, pro-Guelph, of openly Guelph policy, overwhelmed ca the Count in 1288. And that's where the, the famous episode of him being jailed and starved to death together with his children uh, uh, would occur. Uh, immortalized dramatically by Dante, again one of the, the most in fact horrifying passages of the Inferno because it, it's um, uh, suggested that uh, Ugolino may have eaten his children alive for, or dead for that matter while they were imprisoned in one of the towers of Pisa so that, that's the, the kind of things that were done and objectively understand the, the enormous uh, interests that revolve around this this broader policy. So, Pisa basically said, uh, you know what, not to the wealth. It doesn't matter whether you know wealth power is so so high at this point. The Vespers had already um, occurred, so uh, the Angevins had lost Sicily. There was an Aragonese presence. It was also threatening to Genoa. So Pisa decides to break uh, with this kind of wealth experiment and it returns the imperial public sign um, on her um, official seal. So that's the um, traditional imperial Roman Ghibelline symbol of uh, allegiance to the, to the secular order. Consider also the Habsburgs have consolidated an important power at this point that is adverse to the Angevins, or at least in, in negotiations with him, so it's a right moment, but it, it still comes at a, po uh, at a cost um, because uh, Pisa has to conclude a new um, costly peace with the Guelphs, and in 1299 she renounces to Corsica and Lugudoro in favor of Genoa, that is instead uh, supporting the Angevins. And supported by the Angevins. So th this 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 is interesting because you know that uh, e eventually Genoa, especially after the Meloria, had uh, the upper hand on Pisa. And and in many ways, the Pisan investments shifted towards the same Genoa in a way, right? Everything was very flexible; they could be at war, but eventually uh, trading again, and so come participating to to those titles. If you know, in the market were the re most remunerative ones. Uh, but it's evident that the Tuscan Maritime Republic now cannot hold in in the Tyrrhenian the same power it had before, in also in, in the broader Mediterranean, and it gives way to Genoese pressure in Corsica altogether and also in northern Sardinia. And that is kind of the least important part 
um, the Genoese do not have enough strength to threaten to uh, the uh, to, to to strip properly a uh, piece of the control of the entire island, and they they would never actually come to control later, even with the Aragonese um, kick in uh, Sardinia at Pisan expense the entire the entire island. Th this is interesting because they the Genoese would always maintain a presence in northern Sardinia. Technically, the Aragonese claimed also Corsica under their possession, but they never had it. Um, and if the Genoese had just invested a bit more in Sardinia, likely they would have driven the Aragonese away. Also because the interland was always that kind of, uh, kind of uh, pretty autonomous thing that no conqueror was ever too much eager to get in, because it was just brutally wild and inhospitable. Um, but this favored guerrilla against the invaders, so it, it's, it's kind of an interesting scenario. And contrarily to what is normally thought, like the defeat at Meloria in 1284 was not such this, this mm, you know, uh, nail on prison coffin, let's say, per se. We, we, mm, the, the, the city was always very powerful um, for, for generations. Uh, it would turn mostly also to continental affairs. It is true. It, so it, it's a broader defeat, but it's not like the commune crumbling or not having any ambition or not even being able to contend power to uh, to the to the interland and, and not the 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 lack of success in doing so. By the way, um, so I, the. As we were saying before, the, the struggle polarizes between Florence and Pisa. Florence remains um, allied with Genoa most of the time, as the Angevins do. Um, there is a broader banking model that develops in the Guelph axis that the, the Ghibellines remain relatively behind in. Um, and Pisa is still again a maritime power so it it's updated on these affairs it, it has a, a dramatically advanced accounting but also properly mathematical juridical philosophical scientific um, culture um, and it shares it with the broader um, European Mediterranean powers but it manages to, to stem any major interference um, in her own area of interest in Tuscany for, for a consistent time, right? Um, and the old commune uh, wants to fact to make up for its maritime decadence with a more energetic affirmation on the Italian mainland. Right? The, mm, uh, the Florentines would fight against them, also defensively, in that regard. There was still some kind of Visconti influence in the city that uh, meant a Guelph party of sort within. This was normal because every city at the time had sides that would, even if not openly, like either Guelph or Ghibelline compared to the establishment, would always support in that dichotomy the thing. You know that essentially the, the same Guelphs that are that split between black and white uh, in that regard mean Guelph, real Guelph and kind of literally Ghibelline, right? Uh, it's a myth that em emerged from literary ideals of saying, ah, oh, but Dante had a kind of a different idea. Dante was a, a, a full-fledged Ghibelline. I, I don't know how to tell you that, right? Was, this is not a matter of uh, interpretation or finesse because you say but Dante had a different model for from the hardcore Ghibellinism he wasn't like that no he was exactly like that right um, and um, I made a video a series actually on, on Dante for that matter explaining this thing in detail because somehow people still believe in that uh, white wealth and Ghibelline mean literally the same thing um, and uh, all these wars were fought with an enormous degree of proxies and of um, in, in interference, intertwinement of these uh, clans being exiled, uh, then you know carrying out the 
carrying on a, a resistance from the counter side receiving support from other communes so this is the entire mess that never ends but with an enormous power Th these are some of the uh, seriously most advanced uh, phases in medieval warfare right so you find a degree of of properly of warlikeness like properly of constant belligerence and an in of a enormous resources spent that as Contamine as other authors have said make of Italy the most belligerent country in Europe at this point. Um, for this reason of course Pisa st strives uh, as um, as all the the actors involved the finances are are, uh, are exhausted the tax burden is very serious uh, above all there is uh, always this um, potential instability the fact that a political line cannot be followed for too long before the balance shifts in the other direction and regime changes and so on so there are phases in which just like today when people say but like we should continue on this line yes but kind of the people are tired and yes but what do the people actually know about this and so there is in fact always this tension occurring between say maintaining a uh, an internal balance that requires also a political and social stability of some sort and the necessity however of making this more of a state a more hierarchically driven one in some way and so the attempts of establishing seigneuries of some sort Pisa is one of the mm, say there is um, a seigneurial regime there are properly lords uh, that are called to rule but the 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 urban estates always maintain the upper hand on them differently from other italian city-states where fundamentally the seigneury becomes a sort of dynastic monarchy yes always again like many other power at the time including actual monarchies always being negotiated uh, with the with the estates but um pisa maintains the balance here it, it's maritime background that the enormous wealth accumulated by the by the the people and um, still these important activities that we will see also overseas would bring them as far as the Don River and so on um, would make Pisa like a bit of an exception uh, in the Italian especially late communal and early seigneurial landscape because it's a sort of older model that however works still uh, in a very efficient way and this is mirrored by the military success um, the heads of the industries above all the wool merchants are harassed by competition from the Florentines ship no uh, ship owners and sea merchants keep the maritime activity alive um, and there is a general reflection on the glorious tradition of the Republic um, and this new people that are less tied to the past but somehow recognize the the achievements of the commune institutionally and want to preserve them to, to use them also their um, to their benefit um, there is a, an intense debate over war and peace right the, the Ghibellines are still numerous among the common people that again is different from what what, what happens in most most communes um, where generally speaking the Guelph hegemony is countered by gibbling lords of some sort um, the tent toward that direction said the sense again that sense of civic duty that makes the peasants free but still loyal to the empire is, is quite alive um, the Guelphs, however, are also a powerful force. Um, the, as we will see towards the mid 14th century, the Raspanti and the Bergolini uh, will um, still maintain in part that kind of um, kind of face, right? Some industrialists and conservatives, um, with even ship owners and merchants, and part of the new people, but. Um, use any way to stay in power and so also playing with this different uh, say the seizures of, of the past also because Guelph and Ghibelline is something that remains deeply alive 
actually in, in politics. It, it refers um, to very, uh, say, real paradigms, even after the, the contraction of the papacy in the empire with the crisis of the 14th century. Um, so even un trying to understand this is something that requires a bit of background, and today we don't have enough time to, to go in depth for. But we can start um, observing this interesting phase from 1289, when the city government in Pisa was assigned to Guido da Montefeltro. Now, the Montefeltro were a feudal uh, dynasty, originary of the of the northern Apennines, uh, between Romagna and, and Tuscany, and so um, having maintained one of the roughest and more brutal military traditions in the entire peninsula, the Montefeltro were selected individually since uh, an early from an early age, um, being entrusted some units, some companies that were ever larger in order to train them and see if they were fit for the task. And then they would sell their services as podestas, as military commanders, uh, from the top of their military expertise, right? The podesta, especially towards this phase, becomes properly a military commander and a top one. And Guido carries out a military reform that will have probably lasting effects in Pisa, begins to, in to intensely train, especially the the numerous crossbowmen that the city can offer to mm, properly to, to frame infantry in more orderly uh, fashion and, and, and in, in intensively, um, in fact, uh, preparing them to and uh, teaching them the, the various tactics that were developing on the Italian battlefields at this time, especially including the, 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 the terrifying um, Infantry Wing One that was to to essentially shower with the the crossbowmen the enemy once um, up to I don't know tens of thousands of quarrels falling in, in a single hour of fight and then breaking them and enveloping the enemy cavalry in between while it was engaged with their own uh, and this the peasants topped probably European tactics uh, in, in medieval warfare. Right, there, there is hardly any doubt that uh, about the the sheer mm, size, complexity, efficiency, coordination, and uh, widespread level of mm, mm, professionalism that the late communal armies in Italy achieved. Um, Pisa could field armies of even thirty thousand men. Yes, with allies, we will see. Pisa will uh, subjugate Luke at some point. But still, with a, a force that immense, this is a single city, and they were able repeatedly to field these armies, right? More often than even just look at most battles that were fought in Europe and the, the various politics, and how often they even mobilized much more modest armies. And you realize the degree of moral and material forces that these communes were able to to, to put on the field on a, on a regular basis. Because they fought continuously, by the way. Here I'm skipping. Don't think that I'm making the history of uh, every year. Because we would never end. We would have to make hundreds of videos just to cover the period that we cover today. If we were to enter that detail. Because we know that much, by the way. So, the Montefeltro held the city until 12, 1292. Um, and also assumed the position of captain of the people. As well as captain of the... Masnade and Podesta as well. The Masnade were, as you know, uh, the essentially the, the, the mercenary forces of the commune, the professional soldiers paid by the citizenry and that were becoming the backbone of the Italian armies. And controlling them equated to control a great part of the city power. Right? Considered that Pisa at the time had still the an impressive set of arsenals, of probably also public buildings where uh, weapons were stored and so on. It's, it was a deeply functionalized uh, military power in that regard. So in 1307, an electoral reform was launched which concerned the procedure for electing the elders. There were 
12, that is three for each quarter, uh, each district of the city. And in uh, after this this reform, the city is able to um, welcome, by the way, uh, Henry the Seventh in his um, Roman expedition, which he will be crowned emperor. This is the first time after. Um, in fact, after Conradin, that uh, a northern uh, Germanic expedition was mounted up in Italy, and Pisa, in this sense, sided um, faithfully and with an enormous material effort, um, an enormous quantity of money. I mean, Tuscany, basically the entire campaign against uh, Florence, uh, led by Henry, um, which was a failure, by the way, but costed. A, you know, it was the siege of the entire city. It was mostly financed by, by Pisa, right? And also supplied, by the way, in the process. Um, Pisa reconfirmed herself in that sense, uh, the uh, fateful imperial port uh, of the Italic kingdom. And they, they, they made an incredible sacrifice for the Luxembourg um, to the point of also exhausting the city. Uh, at, at that in those campaigns and allowing him to basically exercise a a seniority over the communal but he wouldn't stay there for, for long in any case after the failed seizure of Florence in which the wealth system showed all its massive material and logistical coordination even though the, the Guelphs wouldn't dare to 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 face the the imperial knights um, in, in open field, but you know most of the infantry was was uh, and also at that point, especially at the end of the expedition, most of the the cavalry too were, were Italian. Um, you know from all these various Ghibelline cities, but let's say uh, Henry came back to Pisa. That was the 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 point where uh, the, 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 its base and um, a logistical center there, and that's where also he left for Naples in order to take it over uh, even after the disaster of Florence because first of all yes the, there are the aids from from Aragonese Sicily from uh, from other um, Gilli Ghibelline powers but it's the peasants that sustain all this re um and feeling of an enormous amount of uh, troops as well uh, but as you know Henry dies um, along the way of, of illness or maybe poison um, in the same Tuscany um, that that was a moment in which objectively um, the Angevins were freaking out because they didn't have a they didn't have a real army to to stop the, the one levied by the Emperor uh, and and so things could have easily gone different people say ah you know Dante was a dreamer because you know Henry the Seventh, yes, came but didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. Like he basically shifted almost the entire Po Valley from from Guelph to Ghibelline, and resumed twenty years of warfare that brought also into the definition of Italian seigneuries of, you know, that, that posed this major threat to to, to the Neapolitans. Um, it was a massive thing, a massive expedition, and Pisa had a major role in in, in leading it, and uh, the. Mm, the, the body of Henry is buried, famously enough, in the Pisan Cathedral. There is a beautiful tomb um, uh, erected by Tino da Camagliano that also realized some important status. It was some of the most famous about Henry the VII. Um, and this dream of resurrection was buried there fundamentally for, for the general fates of, of the empire, as the, the, the following imperial expeditions would be just mostly quite um, opportunistic ones for getting the, the sovereign, just the, the imperial crown in Rome and just not interfering more than much, or at least being rather supported uh, by Italy than interfering in it. Um, so, so used literally by these communes uh, as opposed to reestablishing an imperial order. So th this was before the great crisis of, of the 14th century that had to yet kick in uh, but just for saying that things were pretty active and, and alive still by this point. But it's exactly this um, expedition that triggers a series of wars that, that exhausted um, 
enormously all the contendants uh, the, the the Germans intervened with subsidies the the French as well for the Angevins but they the, the world war was fought in central and northern Italy and in this sense Pisa had a major role as well because uh, at the death of Henry the seventh the German mercenaries, uh, the German Burgundian mercenaries that made up the core of Henry's force, while coming back to uh, Central Europe, were actually hired by the peasants that could offer good pay, and so they basically were integrated in the peasant army. That's when uh, Uguccione della Fagiola comes into power in 1313. Uh, the Fagiola were uh, a bit like the Montefeltro, they came from the same areas. They, they were Emilian as opposed to Romagnol, um, but they they lived a bit in the same way. They were feudal lords that sold their services abroad. And Ugochone has an, a very interesting um, military record. He would die eventually in northeastern Italy, fighting for the the La Scala against the uh, the Paduans in the same moment which Dante was exiled there. He mm, interfered also with Arezzo's affairs just next door to Florence, creating a bit of thorn in the side. But definitely his greatest achievements were at the uh, command of, of the peasant army as lord of the city, right? And supported by these masnade that now included literally the what had been the imperial forces. And there is a, a radical Ghibelin ideology that surrounds, in fact, this this regime um, as uh, Ugochone actually makes a coup uh, thanks to his German mercenaries and he's said in fact to have been uh, running on horseback in the streets of Pisa um, calling to the death of the Guelphs of any uh, betrayer that would have supported uh, let's say the enemies in that in that pretty conflictual sense with a, with a living eagle uh, on his vambrace, right, symbol of the empire of Rome, uh, etc. And, and, and this was um, uh, confirmed by m many sources, also in probably in the entire uh, Fagellan ideology before the Battle of Montecatini, as we'll see now, and in this uh, uh, around which polarized the entire Italian Ghibelline party, right? That was a battle specifically in which m the Ghibellines from all over. The country came to fight against the the, the Angevins, the Florentines, and the Guelphs, and winning the most extraordinary victory um, for in terms of combined arms and sheer size and coordination and tricks, etc. We'll have to make a video about that battle today. I, I can't digress too much because the video is going to be already excruciatingly long the way it is. Um, but to make the long story short, Ugochone assumed the same offices as Guido da Montefeltro back in the day. And in, a, in addition, he abolished the reform of 1307 that was somewhat too popular for his tastes. Um, his government assumed a particularly despotic characteristic when he had um, a Balduccio Buonconte, a great peasant politician and merchant, beheaded. Um, these means were quite straightforwardly used also by Mo Montefeltro had been cutting the feet of deserters, had been, there ha it was a brutal disciplined work among the ranks of the Pisan army. And this singly worked, right? In 1314, Uguccione at the Battle of Pontetetto won the possession of the city of Lucca, the great uh, rival of, of Pisa in in the north. Um, and um, if, um, in, in the following year, a strong in fact of the Pisan and the Lucchese army, together in this again magnificent mercenary, uh, transalpine mercenary force and the famed Pisan's crossbowmen, destroyed the Guelph army at the Battle of Montecatini. Um, this was triggered by the siege of the of this castle in the um, in the in the Nievole Valley that uh, was um, uh, fundamentally a, an important Guelph um, Ammon post um, and so what the peasants had done here was just rising up the Arno Valley and getting closer to Florence and kind of triggering this response 
uh, Philip, Prince of Taranto, that was um, an Angevin, a uh, part of the, the royal house, um, uh, came from Naples to Florence, gathering some of this n important French Neapolitan force. Um, and in the city, the, the entire Guelph forces of Italy gathered uh, the Bolognese, the Sienese, um, uh, the, the various Guelph Umbrian powers, other also uh, Lombard forces. Uh, this was a huge battle, 30,000 Guelphs versus 20,000 or maybe almost 30,000 Ghibellines as well, that in w which which only showed some of the greatest feats ever. Basically, he faked a route, retreating after some weeks of, of uh, skirmishes uh, with the Angevin army at, uh, at the castle, um, that you know, the Philip of Taranto had come to force the block, um, retreating to some hills nearby and faking a retreat. And basically, uh, he... The, the, the Angevins thought the enemy was done for. They advanced across the plain without even properly uh, arming their their infantry, especially. And you know it was very hot in the summer, and they, some uh, knights had even taken off their armor and so on. Ugochone maintained control of this army, w made it wheel around, and faced the incoming army, setting up a series of extraordinary feats. First of all, he faked the attack of an entire l battle line that were actually the same the squires dressed up as the elite knights that got themselves massacred and the enemy crossed uh, a, a river then thinking we have already crushed the best of their army um, in the process and that's when actually where they were caught off guard by the real uh, the real elite um, champions that wiped the hell out of, of that uh, battle line and even crashed into the second Angevin one that was advancing under the count of Eboli. Um, and at that point, this the you know the the elite was repelled because there were just a few, and the, the main battle line with the Germans uh, attacked the one of the count of Eboli, and the peasants from the the peasant crossbowmen were made advancing from from the hills and began to target repeatedly by a sort of like a rotation of, of the various ranks uh, with tens of thousands of quarrels on the uh, on the uh, Guelph wings made up by also the Florentines the Senes and the the pikemen the enemy pikemen began to throw up the, the their weapons and um, Ugochone probably used a flank attack by a concealed reserve of German mercenaries that basically made the the wealth wings collapse, and he enveloped the Count of I believe foe to the last uh, until the, the battle line was shattered and all the enemies fled in the nearby swamps and, and th the body of the Count of Eboli was never found. It was a massacre. The Prince of Taranto was uh, sick. Um, he had fever actually before the battle. He was in no good state definitely probably either managed to, to pull his last battle line out or to abandon it and collapse it i mean it was a, a massive defeat uh and that's where ugochone marched as far as florence threatening it but of course uh, florence was too well guarded there was no way pisa could at that point because florence was much um it was bigger than pisa and so and also very well supplied and so on but uh ugochone laid waste the entire Florentine countryside, or almost at least from the side, from the western side, it was uh, a massive blow, and and that revived dramatically the Ghibelline cause. Because by the way, Guelphs and Ghibellines were struggling also in the Po Valley. Um, all these contingents and foes in Montecatini again came from from Lombardy, from from other northern regions as well. So it was a massive. It, it's arguably the single most important battle fought in medieval Europe. It was. Um, uh, very few people know of that, as I was saying before, not even the, the medieval Oxford, uh, the Oxford Medieval Warfare um, uh, the series, um, volumes talk about this, and you can't even understand why, uh, at least th there are reasons that now I could explain that have to do both with historiography, with the fact that these things are not studied at all, in part, um, but it's just reflecting the absolute ignorance, actually, of you know the West in the, its own history, for that matter. So, it would be very interesting to dwell in that 
um, kind of context because the Ugochonist Germans began to raid the entire wealth of Tuscany, by the way. Um, and in spite of the exceptional victory won on August the 29th, 1315, um, Ugochonist prestige was so great that the peasants began to fear him legitimately because he was really authoritarian in his, in his rule. And so a coalition of citizens uh, br brought him down on April the 10th, 1316. He fled. Uh, he was, I think he was already away from Pisa, but, you know, he had eventually to abandon the entire district and uh, taking shelter among the Della Scala in, in, in Verona, where he had, as we were saying before, a military career. He died in battle, by the way, against the, against the Paduans. Now, um, this, this sort of tyrannical government supported by mercenaries, the nobility, uh, the common people, etc., um, is is quite interesting because uh, it, it was directed. It's, it had a massive power directed against the elderly, right? Uh, the the council of the elderly, and um, uh, therefore the same symbol of the communal institution. So this this test that Pisa passed showed that even in case of an extraordinary victory, the commune could uh, say an extraordinary victory of a, of a lord that could. Mm, simply control better the city now with all his force, could resist and could uh, make the commune standing on its traditional feet. This is extraordinary, to say the least. Uh, this wouldn't happen for other cities, as we'll see now. Um, and at, at the same time, um, there was also no need like to go... Uh, fully at war with Florence because yes you could score this massive uh, blows that were already a miracle per se because they literally had defeated the largest and most powerful army in Italy as far as at least the, the numbers and the, the material were, were, were concerned and proving actually that there was a, another model made up of this seigneurial uh, forces mostly mercenary and foreign ones also with a German ideology, the Battle of Montecatini shows there that all the imperial myth, everybody remembered Conrad in, there was this deep hatred towards the Angevins from the, on the other side, so that was deeply important. Um, the Germans eventually would end up serving anyone, also the, the Guelphs and so on, but I mean, these people believed in that ideology, in part this was shared, of course, by the Council of the Elders and so on. The problem is that I mean, the resources ran out. You can't be fully at war uh, against the, the largest power in Tuscany and supported also by a giant such as uh, the Neapolitan Kingdom. And as a single city, it doesn't matter how many allies you are and how kind of robust you are and sustain this for a long time. So, of, of course, there was a negotiation. Pisa would have been very happy to kind of win other positions against the Florentines, but they had also to be concrete about how long could they exploit this thing? By the way, this uh, victory had been scored thanks also to the uh, to the Lucchese forces that were quite um, robust, as we've seen in the uh, especially infantry-wise. Lucca was not so strong as a commune like like Pisa, but initially it had this very pop mm, very mm, populated countryside. And um, a lot of infantry was a bit deprived of this Tuscan communes that had emerged a bit more recently from them compared to the Lombard ones and had kind of more um, middle uh, class kind of people that would join the army, but they were also a bit less experienced in a, in a more advanced type of warfare, let's say. Um, uh, in any case, the, the victories of Ponte Tetto were similar tactics to Montecatini, just were. Uh, ex experimented just to, to make them to perfection them for, for the big clash are a testament to the radically advanced um, military tactics of, of the Pisan army that, that is nothing short of extraordinary we, we don't know exactly how it happened like they were basically the same tactics that, that everybody used but the fact that they topped them in terms of discipline coordination, efficiency, it's leadership it's luck, it's organization it's wealth in part um, but it has probably to do with this political cohesion and also the Montefeltro 
military reform or something like that. So um, it's an interesting set of, um, of feats. Um, at the end of the lordship of Ugucione, the Donoratico, uh, Donoratico or the della Gerardesca basically are the same thing, um, uh, established themselves because there were the counts of Donoratico that were the, the, the Gerardesca at the same time. Um, this took the name from different. Uh, the Gerardesca was the clinic name, the Donoratico was a place where they had the county of within the Pisan dominion. Um, so this dynasty affirmed itself, we can't say, um, together with the, like, properly, like, uh, this this was a seigniory, but it was a people's seigniory, as it's usually called, that it's, it's not the kind of the tyrannic, kind of Visconti Milanese model, it's it's something like, you know, the people accept there is, a, there is a lord, but then retains control of it, and this, this again, in this piece is quite unique, because others do not do the same thing, and so, the uh, Donoratico established themselves first with Gerardo and with uh, Ranieri, who escaped the Lanfranchi conspiracy, uh, further strengthening his power, because these lords also, you know, were to be provided with some power to be effective, right? So also by the by the commune and, and the various councils, there was a support of some sort. Then there were Fazio and Ranieri Novello until 1341. Um, in this phase, um, uh, there, w there were, as we will see, some different f moments, um, let's say, of, of hostility with Florence, but overall, this were pushed by the broader international struggle, not much because of, m of a Pisan convention. Right, Pisa wanted to be left also a bit alone in all of this. It maintains its kind of introvert, say, non-continentally uh, um, expansive maritime uh, attitude, and f there was some Florentine politics um, with which Count uh, Gerardo uh, was in line with. Um, he was first captain general, then lord in 1316-20, and after the Battle of Monte Catina, it was he who concluded the the year after the peace with King Robert of Naples, and in 1317 with the Florentines, by the way. Uh, and the peasants, however, mm, conquered Sarzana in 1317, which was expanding essentially north along the coast to mostly interfere with Lucca, that was somewhat lost also with the, uh, the disruption of Uguccione's uh, scenery. Um, and so this showed the Florentines, look, we are not expanding in your direction, so we are not interested in keeping to fight with you. Um, internally, um, Gerardo shared power with a this ardent um, leader of the people, uh, known as Coscetto del Colle, who was what you would think today as uh, as a populist fundamentally. So they needed this kind of force at some point, but then uh, Coscetto was taken out, uh, literally made and cut to pieces, because populism really gets nowhere, uh, fortunately. Uh, later, uh, Gerard himself approached actually the Ghibelline Castruccio degli Antelminelli, mo most famously known as Castruccio Castracani, that had become, in the meanwhile, Lord of Lucca. Um, the, um, the, the Gerard was followed by Ranier, was, uh, who accentuated the lordly character of the government until 1325, and oscillated between the nobles and the people, between Florentines and Castruccio. Look at this point was Ghibelline, that was the main thing, like up to um, the Battle of Ponte Tet and the Pisan conquest of Lucca, the city had remained wealth fundamentally. Then it changed the regime and even after the Pisans uh, left, Castruccio, that was a, a a Lucchese nobleman, he was the favorite, had been the favorite of Edward II of England, he was 
quite a crafty mercenary. He had fought in Flanders. He was at the head of a great merchant family from the Manch. He was a very, very famous man in his time, both because of his political and military exploit. Um, became Lord of Lucca, in fact, and still as a Ghibelline, as an ardent Ghibelline, so much that he named, for example, his uh, sons, just like uh, the Henry Valor, and this was all the names of the Luxembourg imperial family to show this also international allegiance to the empire. Um, and for, for this reason, Castruccio managed to gain consensus in Pisa as well, uh, and uh, as a consequence, um, supported the Ghibelline cause uh, during the, uh, the the war that Castruccio waged relentlessly from Lucca against Florence. This is very interesting because Lucca was, as we've seen, smaller than Pisa, but Castruccio used it and exhausted it in the process against uh, this giant, who was literally David versus Goliath. And Castruccio managed to score. Uh, another remarkable victory against Florence at the Battle of Alto Pascio, uh, in which he again destroyed this papal Florentine Guelph army, uh, also with uh, significant um, support from the, the Ghibelline alliance. Um, the uh, peasants, however, kept themselves out properly of the, the League of Italian Ghibellines in that, in that case especially at the time of the expedition of Ludwig the Bavarian, who was a very pragmatic ruler. I talked about him at some point in my videos. He was basically financed by the Italians. He entered Italy just with a ridiculous number of, of knights, and then you know all the various contingents uh, joined him, and uh, he had himself crowned uh, emperor in Rome after having... Uh, kicked out the Pope, so bitter struggle, ideologically speaking, but the whole thing was just aimed at, you know, being emperor and coming back to Germany. He tried to besiege Milan in the end, but it was a very clumsy thing. In any case, um, the Pisa was involved in this because um, Ludwig asked, when he was pass uh, crossing Tuscany, first of all, he was allied with Castruccio, and Pisa was saying, yep, we want to be left on our own, and the Bavarian, together with his Ghibelline force, actually obliged Pisa to enter on October the 8th, 1327, and the common people welcomed the, the emperor. And the reason being, as always, that, you know, that it was this populistic push that didn't trust the elite, but um, the consequence of this is that Pisa was basically spoiled of much money that were served to just finance further the campaign of the Bavarian, and Castruccio's war against Florence. He, Castruccio died. Uh, actually, he, after having assumed the same Pisan seigniory uh, during 1328, uh, as a consequence, uh, having supported the Bavarian, with which he quarreled, however, in the end. And so, actually, it, it's exactly the, the common people that paid the highest price of this, because that's, again, the, the eternal moral populism, that is, um, mental deficiency made politics. And um, this was surely an important blow that uh, uh, showed how also at the time really you couldn't really count on an imperial figure anymore because there was no attempt really to reassert German power in Italy. These German princes were just now trying to, to survive within their own um, regional dimension in Central Europe and um, constantly competing with one another. Things are much more complicated than they seem. Castruccio himself has supported first the Habsburgs and then the Wittelsbachs who were rival with one another. So it, 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 it's all that messed up. As you may think, the same German mercenaries quarreled within the Bavarian army because one was pro-papacy, other was against papacy, and incidentally were also from northern and southern Germany. And so they hated each other's guts and you know, at some point they even take Luca for ransom, like this kind of messed up situations that tell you that the system was contracting, right? And the, the finding ahead in all this was very complicated. Um, 
In any case, uh, once this phase was done, Fazio de la Gerardesca expelled the imperial vicar in 1329, made himself the center of the ruling, uh, the ruling uh, estates, let's say, the, this kind of mercantile elite now, and um, it was later created war captain and Dominus Generalis in 1335. Here, mm, repressive measures were also increasing against uh, the, the, the regime was becoming ever more kind of authoritarian because of the, all these blows. Um, Pisa was really squeezed by the Vitas back. Um, and so, in general, things were going bad. There was war everywhere, so the markets were contracting. So it's just a situation that, um, you know, will favor eventually just a state that is more stable on its own. Um, and Pisa, in this sense, would maintain an important capacity, as we will see now. Um, Fazio followed a policy of internal peace and agreements with Florence, with Genoa, with the King of Naples and the Pope. Uh, there was no need, again, to, to have more enemies than necessary, and that broader, let's say, necessity of, you know, aggressing uh, Florence, per se, didn't seem like viable anymore. First of all, it costed too much, and secondly, you could become the new favorite of other powers, because really, Florence herself was moving away from the same Naples, from the same papacy. Um, these powers could not support her anymore, so everything was fragmenting compared to the unitary wealth axis that had been existing in the previous uh, generations, and so the, the thing now favored, again, this kind of more polycentric and therefore more you know playable uh, situation. Fazio promoted also as far as time allowed the economical and cultural revival of the city. Uh, he held power with peace or at least maintaining the city pacific um, and with some glory until his death in 1340. The aspirations of Florence to possess Lucca are rather what triggers again war ag uh, between Pisa and Florence. In fact, um, uh, the, the Pisans had managed, uh, the, 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 the city had been at essentially on sa for sale. It had had several lords, including the De La Scala. I mean, it was pretty messed up story. Perhaps we'll make a video about Luca. In any case, the city was spent, exhausted, but it was still a pretty, you know, a nutrient to 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 absorb in a way. So there was a war between the Florence that had bought the city for an enormous cost, by the way, um, this proportionate one, and so now wanted to seize it. Um, but it was just next door to Pisa, and so the city said, "Wait a minute, like this, the Florence." cannot expand so far, it will immediately start oppressing us. So there was this interesting siege of um, of Luca by the peasants, actually it was a preemptive strike to avoid the Florentines to, to take uh, control, and Florence arrived with an army, a huge one, yet we're talking now again of something like 30,000 men and 30,000 men clashing. Um, and the peasants there won again another major victory against Florence, thanks to the strength of their combined arms and more specifically of their infantry and crossbowmen. Again, so showing that the Florentine army, that included by the way lots of lords also from the same De La Scala, for example, there were some Estes, some uh, some uh, Bolognese, and so on, was crushed uh, disastrously. And Florence was so disgustingly rich that they c she could even afford losing these armies, but eventually times were contracting a bit for everyone, so uh, in the following uh, years there were two coups in Florence as well that brought to a kind of a more conservative policy, because the system was exhausted as well, and so Pisa managed to reacquire Lucca, interestingly enough. At this point, however, there were divides also within the same Pisa, and so and the, the lordship of the commune passed to the, the boy Ranieri. And de facto to the um, Della Rocca that were a uh, member of the Raspanti 
and the the Gerardesca is are extinguished with uh, Ranieri in 1347. All this in a quite heavy political mood where uh, opposed factions were confronting one another tumultuously speaking there were also street clashes and so on battles and behind these two factions internally to Pisa there were uh, Florence and Milan whose contribution was determinant in Pisan policy because the, the Visconti had basically unified uh, most of northern Italy under their control and now were expanding in Tuscany as Ghibellines against Florence and Pisa in this sense was becoming kind of like a pawn in the in the bigger game of, of Milan that control here I mean Pisa barely controlled Luca and Milan controlled like I don't know tens of cities at a time so that that gives you the the disproportion of the scale Florence was kind of in between as size but it was again the the, the richest city in the world um, so it could afford the expenses um, needed to again levy mercenaries and so on at the same time as we were saying uh, however the let's say warfare was changing from this massive armies of tens of thousands of men to kind of like just several thousands uh, mercenaries on horseback I made multiple videos about this transition from the communal army to the to the condottieri so if you search for um, medieval Italian warfare something like Italian communes you will find those things if you're interested people like to learn about them apparently so always make considerable amount of views and I can talk about that if you're interested more um, there are mm, naturally other more menial issues like um, internal strife over the prerogatives that institutions had and consequent uh, on certain assets and consequently um, some families over the entire say non peasant policy for example the direction of commercial expansion and whether this had to be connected with Florence Siena and Genoa so this Guelph axis that still was very powerful economically so it was kind of convenient to follow in spite of this threat posed by Florence in a str more strictly territorial point of view and support of Milan. So Pisa was divided and this was surely not useful for political effectiveness. Um, so this is the actual moment like the mid 14th century in which Pisa declines in somehow uh, an irreverse tilting towards you know subjection to other cities right. Um, the Pisan navy is weakened. The mm, progress of Genoa, Venice, and Barcelona um, in the Mediterranean restricted the sphere of action of the Pisan merchants that either invested in, in these powers and so kind of uh, making their own market uh, weaker, actually, or at least because it was more dependent on these powers rather than else, or they couldn't even. Uh, profit at the moment um, the colonies also are almost completely lost right um, Sardinia is the, probably the major and kind of failure of, of Pisa and also inexplicable by some degree because um, basically uh, there was um, a great um, this is also complicated to explain and we don't have time but to make the long story short Boniface VIII when clashing again uh, ideologically against the French that were still however inoxidable papal allies because as you know the struggle with Philip IV over Caesar Papism and so on mm, gave Sardinia in fief to the Aragonese uh, even though the peasants were still there um, the reason is that uh, at different times the papacy felt the pressure of the Angevins in Naples that could also threaten Rome so there were some games of this kind um, but they were just temporary right this happened one year that maybe the year after they could change their idea because the political situation had changed um, in any case the Aragonese took this seriously in a way 
they realized that the peasant situation was quite uh, delicate in those years and they landed in Sardinia in uh, 13, uh, 20, 23, 24. The, the peasants at that point could uh, actually sent an army at Cagliari that was defeated by uh, the Don Alfonso IV of Aragon um, in uh, this big battle um, in which, again, the, the Pisan army was annihilated, so were the, merc uh, the German mercenaries that were fighting still uh, in the communities would remain a kind of having their own German mercenaries that they must not the must not of the commune were always there. And as a consequence, the, the year after, they also uh, lost the Castel di Castro, that, as we've seen, was the most important fortification in, in, in the same Cagliari, and thus the control of, of, of the island. In the north were the Genoese that continued to infest the island um, and to actually support uh, the Sardinian guerrilla. At some point, the Aragonese would suffer bloody defeats in that process, but still maintain control. Also because they claimed that Corsica was theirs as well, instead Genoa would maintain that till late in the modern age. And uh, the point being that when the Pope that had changed naturally, the, it was John the Twenty Second at the time, learned of how weak the, the peasants had been kind of in resisting to the Aragonese in Sardinia, said, what the hell? Like, you know, not even the Pope at that point needed the Aragonese in Sardinia as well. Of course, the Crown of Aragon made a video about that was quite composite, like uh, Sicily, Sardinia, uh, the Greek principalities, and the same Catalonia and Aragon were, were kind of Valencia, the Balearic Islands were very uh, autonomous from each other. Sometimes, say, uh, these were the ones that invaded uh, Sardinia were properly the, the, the Aragonese from, from the Iberian mainland in a, um, in a, in a political continuity sense, and very often the same Aragonese Sicily wasn't that, uh, but at some point they were even hostile, playing this game again with the popes, with the, with the German emperors, with the Angevins, with the king of France. So it's again an incredibly complicated thing. To make the long story short, Pisa lost the island. Um, and uh, it's been criticized because it said if they had sent at least another army, but probably the, the citizenry wasn't interested anymore in that. Um, we can. I, I will try to make some videos explaining these things as well because they're interesting. And I think I never made a video about Sardinia entirely, so probably will have to make up for that. Um, and um, the island was annexated by the Crown of Aragon in 1326. So the rich revenues and the mines of the islands are are lost. Um, the peasants, as a consequence, compensated with the iron vein uh, in the Elba island that, however, was much uh, smaller. Um, there is an interesting direction is that the, the peasant trade takes in the far east, right, and specifically on the Don River. Yes, as far away as, as Ukraine, practically. As you know, the Genoese, even the Venetians, were in the Black Sea, and the peasants too had been there. Um, and we know of a peasant port that was founded properly by the Republic sometime that we don't know. And the first, mm, mm, the first paper reproducing it is, is dates to 1318, so it may be connected to the effort that the peasants made after the Battle of Meloria to find new markets in, in a way. Um, these were wild areas, like in, uh, the, the branch of the, the Don River in, in the Sea of Azov at the time, the west of today's Rostov on Don. Right, so they are very kind of, in, in Russia, very underdeveloped places still today. You can't imagine what it could be by the 14th century. But what, again, the Italians cared about were, were, the, were the ports. So, there were there was lots of grain being exported from the area. Uh, again, the Genoese had more the most of that, but there were there was an interesting um, th there was enough space for that was from this area. It was far away also for being reached, and there were more costs 
Um, but at the same time, it was relatively unexploited. So the Italians were kind of less competitive because it was a bit like a bit for everyone there, and they were the only ones who had the navies to to carry out this kind of uh, kind of long um, range trade. And this part is unknown, however, because it was probably eventually interred um, or maybe even uh, flooded, we don't know, but probably it lay between the current towns of Ned Nedvigovka and Sinja Voskoy, uh, not very far from the Atlantic Roman remains of an uh, the ancient Tanais, right? So exactly in the corner of the, the northeast corner of the Sea of Azov, when the dawn opens. And um, the mm, the place is, um, again, was famous for grain exports, uh, as a trading manual 1315 said. Um, and we think that the Westerners had suffered an interesting uh, blow at that point uh, around the early 14th century in the Black Sea because the Tartar Khan Totu had uh, expelled with his armies some of them from some of the most important ports. And this smaller Pisan port that had been created maybe from a restructure at least implemented by the Pisans early on seems to have survived in the process. Um, there were interesting points de pu at this point um, uh, still, the, the Byzantine world probably meant, uh, you know, that um, again there was this um, um, anti-Genoese alliance of Pisa and Venice, we recalled before exactly in those years. So it's possible that um, the Pisans had really invested an important amount in, in this, and that the Venetians had somehow allowed it to happen to weaken the Genoese in the area because the, the Venetians and Genoese as you know were fighting in Greece because after even if the, say the, the, the Latin Empire had established all these Venetian presence in in the Aegean then the Palaiologoi reconquered Constantinople through the help of the Genoese navy so Venetians and Genoese remained there and they quarreled and fight and so on they, they invested in an incredible amount of resources to, to destroy each other's uh, fleets and so on so Venice probably helped Pisa to maintain some control, even in the Black Sea, um, in the process. Um, and there we know, in fact, of a specific cooperation at the end of the 13th century, even uh, with Venice essentially paying money to raise galleys in Pisa herself, right? And probably boosting the power after it had been crippled by the Genoese, and this is very interesting. And we um, also uh, know that after the this Tartar raids on uh, and the Black uh, Sea colonies against the the Italian, the peasants remained there, maybe even longer than others at least in that specific um, area of the Sea of Azov. In fact, in the mid-15th century, Florence was still concerned with transferring the commercial rights of this peasant port to herself, right? even though uh, Florence had conquered Pisa, as we will see, uh, um, de a few decades earlier already, and so showing that peasant naval activity was quite alive, and it would probably reach as far as that. Um, the first half of the 14th century is, as we've seen, a, a moment of stabilization, of also of stagnation, if you want, but also of success. Pisa is still illuminated at the time by the light of culture and art, right? The university was revived in the city uh, in 1338. Um, and in 1343 was given the privilege of general study by Clement the Sixth. Pisa would remain throughout all the late Middle Ages a major center of again juridical, uh, philological studies. Some of the finest um, Greek uh, Arabic manuscripts c 
came from from Pisa, also from to bust. For example, the the Roman law studies to reconstruct the ancient Justinian code, and some of the present manuscripts are just by uh, basically the holy grail of of that philological work. The Church of uh, Saint Catherine is with um, so many other monuments, but a beautiful masterpiece of, of Pisan art. There are great names such as Giordano da Rivalto, Bartolomeo from Saint Concord, Cavalca, Guido of Pisa. Um, the city was a center of piety, of eloquence, of studies. The Camposanto area is um, completed uh, with uh, its Romanesque walls and the very elegant Gothic decoration that adorns the, the monument with, uh, together with frescoes and so on. The baptistry has this incredible dome and the crowning of spears and frontispieces. Um, on the Lungarno there is the, the beautiful, um, the miracle actually of Saint uh, Mary de las Pinas is called. It's a little jewel of late medieval architecture and one of the single most beautiful things you can see. Um, politically speaking, starting from this moment of greater decline, we've seen there were different factions, even uh, as early as the during the Donoratico's uh, time. Yeah, these were mostly the Bergolini and the Raspanti. The Bergolini, uh, together with the Gambacorte, the Alleata, these were all other noble families, were in favor of an opening towards Florence uh, to profit the finances and essentially increasing the power of these elites, uh, albeit at the expense of the political independence of the city. Uh, the Raspanti belonged to the Della Rocca family and they were instead opposed to Florence. Uh, from 1347, the Bergolini prevailed uh, with Andrea and Francesco Gambacorta, and at the time of the uh, 1355 Charles the Fort expedition, the Raspanti came, however, to the nominal authority of the city as imperial bikers. Right, Charles the Fort had visited Italy already in his youth. He had been fighting there, and he would come back again. Um, and uh, installing imperial vicars was a way to essentially uh, get their campaign finance in exchange of this um, official titles, like that were some kind of uh, a, a parallel mm, feudal title in, in the imperial hierarchy of some sort, just more uh, ad personam delivered. In 1364, after the Pisan defeat at Cascina on July the 28th at the hands of the Florentines and with John Oakwood, by the way, in the process, the uh, Raspanti took over definitely and, and managed to put uh, Giovanni dell'Agnello, who was one of his uh, members in of, of their members in power. Um, and this was of a merchant condition that uh, didn't appease much the Florentines uh, and, and their party at the same time. For which an agreement was made with Florence anyway um, that costed Pisa uh, its outlet to the sea. In other words, that's when uh, the city loses its maritime independence because it was defeated in battle and um, Florence accepts uh, the continuity of some even you know, kind of more autonomous government but it, at the expense of the control on the peasant port by, by the Florentines. Um, in the process, Lucca and Sarzana were lost, um, and the Visconti actually seized them, uh, filled that gap, because they were again, as we were saying before, expanding in Tuscany.
Agnello, by the way, was a friend of the Genoese Dodger Simone Boccanegra, um, which opens a, a phase of cooperation, part, mm, mm, say, connected with the Visconti influence. Um, and this is witnessed by the several peasant merchant activities open in Genoa and vice versa, by the way. So this is perhaps probably also an attempt to escape um, Florentine uh, uh, pressure in a way. And uh, this is a very well documented uh, phase, by the way, also thanks to the massive amount of documents uh, left us by the merchant Francesco Datini. Agnello attempted to make power personal and lasting, right? He, in this sense, alternated a bit between the, the Bergolini and the Raspanti, so consequently between the Florence and the Visconti, and at the end of his career he remained isolated, right, accused of despotic government. As a consequence he lost his lordship when Emperor Charles um, descended in Italy again. Thanks to the creation of the St. Michael Company that was founded in 1368, the Bergolini and the Raspanti reached some sort of agreement until Pietro Gambacorti became lord of the city which would govern until 1392 resuming essentially the government style that had been of the Donoratico right and in this sense trying to restore the grandeur that the Republic experienced um, in, uh, in the moment of its greatest expansion and flowering. Um, in this moment economy was favorable in fact the, the merchants grew in power considerably um, the wall system was transitioning properly to a banking one properly meant in modern terms that the Italians were pioneering um, and this allowed Pisa to still remain within the um, or properly even to re-enter proper for the first time in, in the international trade circuits Pisa expanded its commercial network towards the whole Mediterranean. Um, the Gambacorti created, was created captain and defender of the people, as properly as a formal title at the, uh, at the moment of his election. And um, he exploited, in this sense, a, a broader, say, discouragement that citizens had towards taking public office considering the difficult time the fact that um, at least politically Florence wasn't and, and, and the Visconti weren't to let much of an independent uh, power managing to, to, to capitalize on some on its own condition and um, the Gambacorti really worked well in that sense uh, he kept also close with with Florence or at least he opted for peace in a, in a general sense um, and he managed even to conclude some sort of broader agreement in 1389 for mm, sort of Italian League this is interesting because it predates considerably the uh, the, the ones that uh, the the seigneuries tried to establish in the region um, in, in the mid 15th century um, the Visconti party however was jealous of this leaning towards Florence and Jacopo da, da Piano that gained the Milanese support mm, carried out a coup in 1392 that essentially got rid of the Gambacorti and Pisa thus shifted towards Milan that uh, offered uh, Gian Galeazzo's protection to the commune which was properly sold to the Lord of Milan by his son Gerardo in 1399 right as a consequence uh, as a consequence Pisa 
became properly part of the Visconti state, right? Uh, up to this point, yes, there had been some sort of um, of pressure of um, political, uh, let's say, siding, but there had n never properly been an acquisition which arrives at the end of the of the very end of the 14th century. Um, so long. Uh, Byzantine independence had lasted, and as we've seen, still with some degree of, of autonomy after all. At the death of Gian Galeazzo Visconti in 1402, in fact, the, the commune mm, came back to, to sort of independence because this was a problem with the Mil Milanese government that being somewhat dynastic, there were some discontinuities at the time that made this broader scenery over northern and even parts of central Italy kind of contracting or expanding depending to, to the circumstance. Um, and under uh, uh, Gian Galeazzo's illegitimate son, Gabriele Maria, uh, Pisa continued thus for a, for a while in, in, in a sort of still pro-Milanese orbit. As this happened, Florence realized that uh, another uh, Milanese attempt to consolidate power in Pisa could be very threatening for, uh, for her, and fueling the unpopularity that Gabriele had uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in Pisa, Florence bought the city in turn for 250,000 florins and occupied it, right? Because if the Milanese had consolidated there again, they, they would have cut essentially the main opening, Florentine opening to the sea. Interestingly enough, the peasants resisted to this annexation in, let's say they, they finally were crushed, but they put up an armed resistance that ended in, uh, on October the 9th, 1406. Um, so the initial period of the Florentine domination was particularly harsh due to the uh, obvious consequences that a direct occupation from a foreign power would actually entail. Um, the Florentines wanted to seize the peasant capitals, they succeeded, now they had uh, you know, the upper hand on the center, and the entire situation was pretty stressful, let's say, for for anyone involved, really, there was always a threat of further um, political upheaval and war. Um, so mm, Florence, uh, in the, the year after the annexation, ordered the construction of fortifications and the permanence of a strong military contingent, which was a bit like the seigneurial measure used by anyone to control powers. Florence had a s sort of confederal idea of its own power because it was acting as the great protector of freedoms, um, of communal freedoms in, in this kind of republican Tuscany and not like the terrible Milanese tyrants that whose political practice was actually much more orderly and successful by a degree of st state building by the way and producing an important stability as well that Florence was very often too lazy to or too tight-fisted to pay for in spite of the enormous wealth that it, that it, that it had. Um, the, the reconstruction of the citadel that had already uh, been edified in, in the past um, was, um, uh, was necessary due to the fact that it had went gone destroyed during the same siege, right? There were also other fortifications in the area of the old arsenals. Most of what we can see reconstructed today is the Medician one later on. And also in the Kinzica district um, that uh, were carried out. The, the control of the city was entrusted also to a contingent of 1,500 men, as we've seen, uh, an important force considering that you know, up to a few times before, like just a few hundred men would have been necessary. But Pisa was big, right? So it was important to man it properly because the people was uh, had proven 
to be dangerous for for occupants um, also some peasant citizens that were considered dangerous were confined to Florence and this measure concerned about 300 of them uh, belonging above all to the noblemen and to the to the merchant families um, as a consequence a lot of um, wealth was uh, dried up in, 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 in Pisa right there was a depopulation as well because all these big names had retinues followings they were also local normally local ones that were paid um, so this elite was dispersed and as such the, some of the most important connections for for the population um, there are so many different families um, that moved away properly it also before f the Florentine uh, let's say purge for example from the early f uh, 14th century the Aliata di Vanni di uh, Gaetani di Damiani di Agnelli di uh, Cordini di Bonanni Uppezinghi Galletti di Settimo di Gambacorti Palmerini di Vernagalli Mastiani Pandolfini del Tignoso Grassolini da Vecchiano uh, de Bernardi and many other families um, literally left the Gerardesca as well, uh, the Compagni de Caetani, moved to Florence because they saw, like, you know, like an opportunity. Some went to Rome, talking about di Lante, di Roncioni, di Angeli, di Campiglia Ceuli, where they transplanted entirely. Others moved to Lucca, others to Genoa, but it was a, a massive exodus of, again, some of the finest Pisan. Uh, establishment and so this was basically beheading the the city in practice taxes were high because the Florentines of course didn't give a damn <laughs> about this they had been the, the rivals of, in Tuscany for such a long time uh, however uh, it was important not to prostrate Pisa too much not just to discontent it to, to lose the local favor, but also because it, it still had an important potential, right? Um, there were some tax reductions in the following years, the effects of which were, however, nullified by the wars that Florence was fighting in the 20s of the 15th century were quite demanding and thus drew money from the entire um, dominion. Um, there was also a war against Lucca, which specifically devastated the, the Pisan uh, countryside and thus re reducing the city's uh, power and uh, resources further. There was essentially a captain of the people and a podesta that were maintained as um uh, as offices but uh, these would also be unified later under the sole person of the captain uh, it was known as the decem pisarum which was eventually replaced um uh, in turn in 1426 by the new florentine magistracy of, of the consuls of the sea um, that uh, had almost full powers on the city thus representing the Florentine government in a much more um, essentially centralized and um, externally directed way. In the commune where the elders were replaced by the priors also a shadow of, of autonomy remains. The nobility disappears as we've seen through this killings, sometimes exiles, voluntary or forced the wool industry that had been an important one is sacrificed to uh, to the, the Florentine uh, competition. The arts are subjected also to the ones in Florence. They languished. Taxes, as we've seen, remained, generally speaking, high. Uh, in spite of this, the travelers visited Pisa and commented on the fact that it was a remarkable city. Um, and objectively 
it, it was like for European standards it was a, a very important center and still you know one of the most prestigious and active also culturally or artistically just um, it, it was politically and identically humiliated by the Florentine domination as you understand um, and there was also general impoverishment um, at the same time right uh, later says the houses were s say devastated by the the the, the soldiery um, the they they looked like uh, howls because people didn't have the the money to pay taxes anymore Th they abandoned the place um, so it, w it was like that grim albeit still within you know the standards of, of a medieval city of that size and, and relevance it is estimated that around the 30s of the 15th century the peasant population had halved compared to just um, the, the time of the conquest right that's how brusque the contraction really was um, naturally the peasants were not completely um, despoiled of some kind of resistance capacity because again the city had to remain functional for for an effective Florentine government and so there was some local um, families that could hope to make a coup of some sort in fact there was a conspiracy prevented by Archbishop Giuliano de Ricci who informed the Florentine authorities which um, you know extended uh, also the repressive measures um, the mm, the peace of Ferrara in 1433 spared the city from the looting that would have undergone uh, that could have undergone in that moment the Medici lordship was established um, there was um, a shrewd policy as you know carried out by Lorenzo de Medici that um, uh, somehow mm, uh, carried out important activities of reform and also of reclamation uh, for say allegedly the health of the citizens right and in, in this process he, he enlarged the old palace of San Matteo where um, he often retired to rest right um, there was a um, boost of the peasant studio in 1472 where uh, Lorenzo's son Giovanni sat as a disciple and there were many famous disciples and teachers coming from there um, at that time Benozzo Gozzoli was completing the cycle of frescoes in the Camposanto so uh, surely Florence also spent money to reinforce peace as one of the main the second you know at that point like I said they, they occupied Siena but they um, they uh, I mean Pisa was just a, a very important center as well after, after Florence definitely among the most important of Tuscany um, and yet people complained of the general misery let's say in the fact that at least they, the peasants didn't like Florence at all so mm, I would stop to this because there would be th the occupation by Charles VIII in 1494 when Pisa claimed freedom under French protection right um, but it would be eventually uh, um, uh, abandoned by France the Habsburgs intervened but um, th there was a moment of a revival of force but this enters the modern age um, in any case the city f uh, folded back to the Florentine dominion on the longer run and that was just the, the broader destiny could hope let's say to to receive this external help foreign seigneuries but at the end of the day um, its independence had uh, had long gone and so we arrived to the end for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content 
And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.